Hello, everyone. It is an honor and privilege for me to have this opportunity to be part of the Oslo Freedom Forum. In the past years, I attended the forum and listened to incredible stories from brave souls. Those who, in spite of facing atrocities, didn't give up. Those that stayed hopeful when everything looked dark. Those that kept fighting for values such as human rights, democracy, and freedom. I listened to their stories, to their touching stories, grieved and felt outraged, but was also inspired by their courage and kept my promise of fighting for values such as democracy myself, a promise that I made when I was living in the land of Ayatollahs. The word Ayatollah reminds many of people on the current regime of Iran. The term describes a high-ranking caloric and authority in Islam. But for me, it has more of personal connotations. It reminds me of my dad and my life growing up in the house of an Ayatollah. When my dad was a young man, his interest in learning more about Islam took him to a seminary. He spent several years in Qom, the most religious city in Iran, and in late 60s, he started visiting Najaf, a city in Iraq where the eventual founder and leader of the Islamic revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, was living in exile because of his opposition to the Shah. My dad was fascinated by Khomeini's thoughts and vision. Their relationship grew to something higher, like a guru and devotee. Ayatollah Khomeini considered my dad one of his most trustworthy friends and his representative to assist people in their religious efforts. My dad used to smuggle Khomeini's political messages and revolutionary manifestos to encourage people to join the movement. He was also supporting the movement financially. Because of his political activities, my dad was even jailed in the 70s. But after the revolution, he became a high-ranking figure in the new Iran. He's still praised for his role and philanthropic contributions in Iran. I was born two years before the Islamic Revolution, the youngest daughter in a big family. In fact, with the same number as a football team. 11 members. Politics and religion played strong roles in our family. For example, we would refuse to meet any relative if they would express different political view. In my elite school, I was not supposed to sit next to a child of someone who was not as religious as my family or was not entirely devoted to support, to support the regime. We were supposed to dress up very conservatively in public and avoid socializing with those that my parents would call them ordinary people. Whenever I would ask about why my family couldn't do what, what others do, the answer always would be that we are different. I knew that this had to do with having an ayatollah for a dad. From my childhood, I have strange memories. Being in the house of Ayatollah Khomeini, receiving high-ranking government officials in our, in our home regularly as guests, seeing my friends or relatives uh, on TV or reading about them on the news. Through all of these surreal moments, I found a refuge for myself in my dad's big library, where I spent most of my time reading books. Although by the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, and uh, many Western philosophy, literature, and even some Iranian books were vanished from my country's bookshelves, I was still able to find some of them in an abandoned corner of that library, gathering dust away from public access. Those books created the spark and eventually in in inspired me to fight for my freedom and rights. Each book was like a window to another world. The combination of classical Persian and Western books helped me to draw my future. I wanted to become an independent, educated, and adventurous woman. 
who would travel the world, discover new horizons, and learn every day. To reach my goal, I sat for an exam and won a, won a place at the university, the first female member in my family to do so. I happily announced the victory to my family, but my happiness was ruined by my dad's harsh reaction. He told me, while in my house, my daughters are not allowed to go to university. After marriage, they must ask their husbands. This is where I came face to face with the realities that my father and the regime created for many women in Iran, a life with limited rights and opportunities. I cried and literally begged for my right, for my right to education. I was down and desperate, couldn't eat or sleep. Finally, my dad demanded me to sign a statement where I could go to university if I would accept his terms. I had to agree that if a suitor, who was considered a suitable man by my family, would disagree with my schooling, I would abandon my education immediately to marry him. The threat of forced marriage broke my heart. On the one hand, I had to go to university. It was my dream, my right, my path to the future. On the other hand, I could not sign that letter and let go of my dignity. I carefully added the word I in that statement, making it if I chose a man. As I knew, and I know that I would never consider a man who disrespects women's rights as a suitable companion for anyone. The next day, not only did I start university, but also began to plan my next steps. Time was passing, and I still had to hide my liberal secular thoughts. I tried to act out the role which was expected of me, to be obedient, religious, and passive. I had no right to work or build a career. Playing and listening to music was strictly forbidden. My passion for visual and performing arts were not accepted. My interaction with, with the society was restricted. My question would remain unanswered. I would get scolded for my appearance, and my dad would become furious when occasionally some of my university teachers would inform him about my outstanding performance at the university. He didn't want me to be visible in the public sphere. My dad's treatment of me is, in a way, a microcosm of how the, reg how the regime suppresses the Iranian people. Later on, a dispute broke between my dad and an official at the university. To put pressure on my dad, he accused me of promoting liberal thoughts and made a case against me. This made things much more difficult. I was only 20 years, and my life was a nightmare. I looked around and saw nothing in, life, in that life was mine. After constant criticism and even death threats, I didn't dare expressing my true beliefs and feelings. Friends, it is unbearably frustrating to, who, to hide who you are from even your own family who loves you. All the stress and depression and lack of control started to take a toll on my health. I finally came up with two options. I would either leave the country in my quest of finding my rights and freedoms, or I would end my life that was being used as a container to hold an ideology which was not mine. I worked hard and secretly got a student visa, and against my dad's will and approval, I left my beloved Iran. Until the last moments of my stay in Iran, I was told that everything I planned was based on illusion and detachment from realities and I would fail and feel regret. As Dorkin says, some people think that for women, the earth is flat, 
And if we venture out, we will fall off the edge. Some of us ventured out, and we have not fallen off. And surely, we will not fall. About 15 years have passed from that day, and I'm delighted to be alive and here with you today. The last decade, I have lived in democratic societies. I have graduated as top students, studied two master degrees in European and Asian university. I have learned how to play music and acted at theater, traveled the world on my own, built a career, and sat on board of international organizations. Today, I'm not that young girl who begged for her rights in tears, but an independent person who demands the fulfillment of human rights. And with every chance that I have, I raise my voice for human rights and challenge politicians who would compromise on democratic values. Of course, I challenge the Iranian officials when they lie. For example, recently, Iran's Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs said that we do not jail people for their opinion. He also said that he didn't know who Major Tavakoli was, a very well-known student who was jailed by the regime for expressing his political opinions. But I also challenge those politicians and officials in the West who fall silent and submissive in the face of human rights violations in Iran. It is true that today, under the totalitarian regime of Iran, no one has freedom. And friends, one cannot overstate how much discrimination and violence has been waged against Iranian women. Recently, there have been attacks on women's reproductive rights, restriction on courses open to women at the university, women prohibited at, at a sports stadium, acid attacks on young women, the mandatory hijab, and even cases where women have been punished just for defending themselves from rape. But women are not the only ones who suffer from violations. Iran's intolerant regime denies the rights, rights of anyone who thinks differently and punishes them. Religious and ethnic minorities, LGBT communities, human rights activists, journalists, and political dissidents, all of them have been deprived from their rights and sometimes even their lives. It is heartbreaking to see that intolerance has become the norm in the Middle East. What was caused so much pain is essentially the lack of tolerance and respect, the forcing of homogeneous ideas by law, the murder of creativity. However, there are many of us who celebrate different people and different opinion. Many of us who would like to have a colorful Middle East. Those who appreciate the friendship between nations instead of enmity. Dialogue instead of conflict. Those who do not want to throw people into the sea or remove any country from the map. The growing conflict in the Middle East are no longer a regional challenge, but a global responsibility. We at the Center for Cultural Diplomacy and Development plan to build bridges over troubled water to connect people and promote democracy, equality, prosperity, and tolerance. Please do join and support us with your valuable wisdom and actions. And to those who try to frighten us, good luck with that. And to those friends, men and women, who are struggling in the dark corner of life, you are not alone. Stay hopeful, be strong, believe in your dreams, make them reality, and never give up. I speak from personal experience when I say that together, we can face any challenges as deep as the ocean and as high as the sky. Thank you.